Thank you. And I, I, I was not spam. You know, I, I found you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we're going in order on the, the uh, cheat sheet here, and I'm not going to read bios because we don't have enough time, but the next writer, Hugh Fitzsimmons the third, is going to read from his memoir um, that I am intimately familiar with. Hugh Fitzsimmons. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to Trinity Press and to Malibran, uh for, for hosting this. It's, it's really wonderful. I um, appreciate it very much. And many thanks to Allison. Um, yeah, it was hard on her uh, um, editing this book. I had a jumbled mass of emotion, but she uh, made sense out of it. And I really appreciated that. Um, this book uh, is a reflection on uh, my life and the land uh, where I live uh, in Dimmitt County, Texas. Uh, my family, uh, it's a story of uh, ranching, water, uh, family, and fracking. And um, I'm gonna uh, read from it tonight, um, mainly about um, immigration uh, and uh, also in my experiences with it. Uh, and also um, water and fishing, uh, because that's played a big part in my life. Um, so I'm gonna start this way. <clears throat> a fisherman's approach to life can be discerned from his tackle box. The orderly approach to obtaining what he cannot see, but knows is perhaps lurking just below the surface. Back in the cane break, or around the bend where cattails hark and bend as the breeze moves. In my box is a magnificent deep royal red Garcia Ambassador bait casting reel, a device as likely to implode and ruin a day as was ever formulated by the hand of man. The trick is to adjust the force of one's cast and the flight of the lure to the resistance of the reel as it gives up its line. Now, on this warm spring day, a bass flips the surface under the overhanging willow branch. I curve a perfect arcing cast that lands my hula popper just so. I let it sit until the remnants of the ripples absorb themselves back into the green water and give it a deep gurgling pop. Nothing. A fat grasshopper clicks and rattles like some airborne jalopy landing on the limb beside me. A rise on the opposite bank signals a new opportunity. I retrieve the ambassador, loosen the stainless tension knob to get more distance and let her rip. The popper arcs through the air with ease, then dives in mid-flight. I know what I will see before I even look. My beautiful red reel has given birth to a tangled mass of monofilament the classic bird's nest. I let out a sigh of disgust. The grasshopper vaults for the far side of the creek and lands short, lost forever as he disappears below. I retreat to daddy, hand him my rod and reel. He takes it from me and smiles, pushing back his flat brimmed soft straw hat and adjusting his glasses. Without a word, without a glance in my direction, he begins the task of a parent, the slow, deliberate study of a tangled mass of passion gone awry, where good intentions meet with too much mustard. And the only response of the unresponsible is to go about the business one is meant to do, untangling the past to let me cast again and give rise to the hope and quiet satisfaction of landing what remains below the surface. This book was inspired uh, by uh, a monolith, uh, by a very large uh, rock that's approximately two and a half, three stories of sandstone. 
Uh, it's known in, in geologic parlance as a pillar. Uh, it's sandstone that was harder than the surrounding rock. So when the seas retreated uh, and it, this rock was harder and it remained, um, it's on a very wide uh, prairie that's surrounded by mesquite and brush, but it stands out uh, much as if you've seen Ayers Rock uh, in Australia. It's the same kind of idea, except it's a much tinier version. Okay, it's called Cathedral Rock. The rock was warming with the day, and the slow southeast breeze off the prairie gave, was steady now. Below me, I watched as intermittent gusts of wind pulsed in waves, sending fluorescent green dewgrowth mesquite into temporary spastic fits and twists. Above me was a perfect foothold, and with an extended reach and stretch, I wedged my boot firmly in the crevice, swung my leg up, and came face to face with a name I know. Billy and Tommy Ward. Family Picnic, 1968, was etched in stone. When I first met Billy, the patriarch of the clan, he was standing by a swimming pool and holding a can of Lone Star beer. He was wearing a sleeveless cowboy shirt, replete with pearl snap buttons, over a pair of bathing trunks that he had probably outgrown in junior high. On his head was an enormous Mexican sombrero. On his feet, hand-tooled, lizard-skinned cowboy boots. A silver belt buckle the size of a small dinner plate was cinched around his trunks, holding up the rather sizable reservoir of a lifetime of Lone Star, and completing a one-of-a-kind sartorial statement. Billy obviously considered this a formal pool party. When I joined the group that had gathered around him, Billy was at the tail end of one of his favorite performances. He was regaling the boys with the legend of Billy the Linebacker, relating his time as a member of the Carrizo Springs Wildcats football team. Of course, I started to slow down after a while, he lamented, while patting his gut. Toward the end of my senior year, coach started to call me Dunlap. Taking the bait, I asked him, why did he call you Dunlap? Well, one day he walked into the locker room after practice and said, Damn, Ward, your belly's done left over your shorts. <laughs> Howling at his jokes, Billy tilted backward on the heels of his boots, catching himself at the last moment and stumbling forward, jostling foam from his beer as he righted himself. After the pool party, we all descended on a BYOB joint out toward the river called the Pan American Club. It was a windowless cinder block dive painted black with pink and violet cleft notes dancing down the facade. Here, Billy's brother and his wife joined us. After a brief stint on the dance floor, where Billy had tried valiantly to dance with two different women at the same time, he retired to the parking lot in the bed of his pickup. He lay there on his back, counting out loud the stars in the sky, but never being able to make it past seven before they all blended together. Back inside the club, one of our fellow party goers nudged my leg under the table. Her hard brown eyes were fixed on the dance floor as two scarlet red lacquered lips platted themselves with death precision around the filter of a Virginia Slim's menthol 100. She took a long pull, leaned back, and cut her gaze to me. In a throaty whisper, she purred. Listen, Sonny, don't be such a scared cat. It's my husband that's married, not me. <laughs> a cold wave of weakness washed over me. And just for an instant, I looked into the eyes of this dance hall veteran who was just slightly younger than my mother. Then I bolted from the table like a frightened rabbit, retreating to the parking lot to see if I could help Billy get past seven. <laughs> a smooth sheen of the faintest light floated in from the east as I stood on Cathedral Rock, a shift in hue that prompted birds to take wing. They left their raucous chorus, a challenge to their brethren, 
but a siren's call to me. That day I didn't have the sound of songbirds for long. In the distance, the drone and low throaty rumble of a 20,000 horsepower Caterpillar diesel engine slowly shattered the morning stillness until it engulfed everything. A multi-million dollar 16-stage zipper frack pulsated 8,000 feet beneath the ranch. The clanging of drill pipe and a sudden burst of fuel to the engine sparked the air. On the horizon, a thick black cloud of carbon puffed into the pale blue sky. Men, money, and machines united to obliterate a silence that had always been one of the best reasons to remain in this remote part of Demet County. The dust and the din, the clamor of pipe, and the jolting report of a heavy chain, the circumference of a tree trunk beating against iron drove me higher on that rock refuge. In the midst of that cacophony, a scissor tail tried to set the boundaries of his territory. Arcing like a roller coaster between treetops and brush line, he forewarned all who were within the sound of his song that he alone was lord and master of that space. Fanning his long forked tail feathers, wide he slowed his descent and came to rest eight feet above my head. Leaning back, I stared at his slate gray breast, the faintest trace of pale, rose-colored feathers flecking his regalia. For millennia, the flora and fauna of this land have endured a protean climate and finite resources. In the prophetic words of the late and longtime Demet County resident, Sonny Dolnick, no country promises you more and delivers less than this place. <laughs> but when and if moisture returns and it arrives, it means mating. And when the inevitable flip side arrives, there is no choice but to abandon or die. But now the game has changed. The conventional drilling that had been operating on the ranch since 1923 gave way to fracking in 2008. But because oil men know humankind so well, they omitted the deleterious effects one would suffer from fracking and began the party with a big bag of money. It took a while to realize that there was a huge cost. Our precious water was being mined, extracted from our aquifer, and then injected along with a chemical cocktail of toxic carcinogens into the Eagle Ford shale below. This liquid and sand mix explodes and fractures the shale rock. If done correctly, and with precision, the frack stays where the engineer wants it to go. But a dip in the formation and an unexpected turn thousands of feet below the surface can lead to disaster and the contamination of your fresh water. At the steering wheel of this juggernaut of a hydrocarbon holiday is a mindset that urges us to get as much as you can while you can and while the getting is good. Or, God forbid, before the price of a barrel of crude hiccups and goes from up to down before you know what hits you. In a pasture closer to my ranch house, I could see my herd of bison grazing placidly, oblivious to the changes around them. Moisture graced the soil, grass sprang forth, and the herd ambled on. They were then and are now the future of this ranch. Without our underground water, we might as well be on the moon. And water is what it is all about. Our aquifer recharges at a snail's pace, far more slowly than we are being mined. Back in 2011, during our most recent one-year drought from hell, I found my way back to church to pray for rain. Just as there are no atheists in far, just as there are no atheists in foxholes, there are few atheist ranchers, especially when it has not rained in six months. At best. I should be described as a wayward and itinerant member of the Holy Trinity Congregation in Carrizo Springs. After the service, while visiting with the other parishioners, an out-of-town oil man who was there to get what he could before someone else did, casually mentioned to me a fact his company had imparted to him when I brought up the subject of water use for fracking. Well, my people tell me that if this boom keeps going the way it is predicted to, Demet County only has 14 years of fresh water left. I nodded, turning my gaze first to the freshly painted beadboard ceiling on that old church and the stained glass window above the altar that depicted the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
I will need them all. For unchecked, this headlong rush into the chasm of consumption will undoubtedly be remembered as the time when we killed what we had in order to get what we probably didn't need. I climbed steadily, cautiously toward the summit. Every crevice, every dark hole, and indentation could have been a snake den. I slowed my pace, letting my eyes rest on the flat, smooth surface just above me. The slab of stone had been rubbed level, creating a vertical tablet in the rock, deeply incised in the unmistakable cuneiform style of European lettering was one word, faint on the edges, an R followed by an E. Then mind and logic converged as I tried to describe meaning where there may have been none. Leaving one's mark on a rock is something my grandfather would never have done. He left his impression on people instead. He would consider it beneath him and frivolous to take the time and make the effort to carve his name and a natural feature of the land, but somebody did. I scrambled and searched for more, but time and weather had obscured the message that once must have meant so much to whoever left it. I traced my fingers and the indentations in the stone. I felt more than saw the word. Regrettable, 1741, memory. Memory in any language was the perfect word for that day. I knew I couldn't move forward until I looked back. Like looking in the rear view mirror, I saw the obstacles avoided, the near misses, and the fender benders. The head-on collision could finally be viewed from where I sat. I stared at the changing landscape below me. What can one man do? I have time for one more short one. I don't, is that okay? Anybody going to throw a rock? Oh <laughs> <clears throat> um, I've always turned to the Rio Grande for comfort, solace in my life, and I've paddled it several times, and this is one of my experiences uh, on it. Um, it's a it's something that's not only very meaningful and powerful to do, but very few people uh, know about it. It's utilized a great deal in Mexico by uh, families, picnickers, um, people who enjoy it. On our side, um, it's, it seems to be infused with fear, but it's just really not that way. Um, With this in mind, I mustered the determination to set aside time for the river again. And there, I got a story I want to pass on. I planned to do the same run I had done alone, but this time I wanted companionship. My paddling partner was Colin McDonald. He's the intrepid soul who in 2014-15 paddled the Rio Grande from his headwaters near Creed, Colorado, where my father and I went fishing all those years ago down to Boca Chica, Texas where the river empties into the Gulf of Mexico. On his journey, he carried a small vial of melted snow from its source in the Rockies all the way to the sea. He even walked the approximately 300 mile dry stretch south of El Paso, where there is no water today. I didn't have a vial of snow to take with me for symbolic delivery, but every so often, I need to remind myself of the river and of the source of life to bring an open heart and mind. It was a warm June morning and recent rain had enhanced our chances for making good time by swelling the normally placid river to a decent depth and flow. Freddie, who's my foreman, waved goodbye as we floated away from the bank. The surreal outline of the Kickapoo Lucky Eagle Casino watching over us as we drifted away from the present and into the past. No matter how many times you've traveled the same river, you never know what it holds for you when you glide into its waters. The river is as calm as you are, or as tempestuous as you might need to be. You stroke and watch the world go by, carried by thoughts in the current of what the dam upstream has spilled the night before. Add to that mix your own emotions 
that on land found no resolution. On the water, sometimes the log jam breaks. The river roils and churns all those fragments until the mix of muscle, time, and movement converge to put you in a proper place. You find yourself in a boat, a vessel of time and space to hold you and your companion as you head downstream to see what the rest of the world is dealing with. Time dissolves on the river as past and present meet. Carp, nearly the size of a small submarine, roll on the surface, then disappear into the muddy depths. With each stroke, I shed the present. Birds are the ever-present harbingers of hope. The males with resplendent beauty, catching light and moving with purpose. The females in the background, attending to the important business at hand. boat tail grackles, giant belted kingfishers, ospreys, red-winged blackbirds, the oh my call of the giant Kiskadee flycatcher, hidden in the mass of cave, but audible to all, and every but as jolting at the sight of plumage yellow, black, and white, crested caracaras patrol the sky. This carrion-dependent species knows one true thing about a river. It is where many living things go to die. My only fear is my uncertainty about what might be lurking behind a fallen log or hanging in the dim light of Carrizo Cane undergrowth. It's great camouflage for people hiding from the Border Patrol, and it's the same cane I attempted to carve into a spear when I was a child, laying the palm of my left hand open. I trace that scar every time I feel the need to hurry through life and neglect the living. The floatsome hasn't changed. Suspended aluminum Tecate cans tied to the cane are markers of propriety, setting boundaries for those who are san <coughs> for those who are sanctioned to use this passageway and putting on notice those who would dare to enter. Bobbing plastic detritus is held fast against the bank of the current. Abandoned deflated inner tubes that once ferried those who were bringing equal parts of fear and unbridled hope barely stay afloat. As we paddle downstream, we pass a group of old Mexican men on the U.S. side who have chosen this Saturday morning to do a little fishing. Unlike the supposed fishermen I encountered on my solo journey, these were the genuine article. Sipping a mid-morning beer and watching their corks bob in the ribble of the river, ripple of the river, they seem entirely content with where they are. In my broken Spanglish, I ask them if they have caught anything. The elder of the group can't resist, showing me he hoists a 20-inch catfish. Two of the other men wave. The last one stares at his cork that will not bob. Sound on the water carries. Behind us, behind us, upriver, the steady, full-throated, and unmistakable drone of an aircraft engine breaks the silence of our surroundings. It's a Border Patrol airboat, and it bears down on us. Its engine sheds the, shreds the placid air and fills it with the unmistakable scent of high-octane gas. We wave, and the two officers on hand acknowledge our presence with inspection through their field glasses. They're suited up in Kevlar bulletproof vests with, with two-inch thick headphones to protect them from the noise of their craft. Obviously, they're not intent on sneaking up on any would-be refugees or contraband smugglers. Their boat scatters anything and everything around us. They don't have to shout it. The boat does. Get out of the way, it screams to every would-be crosser. Go back. The boat passes, leaving a churning wake behind. Ten minutes later, it returns, sending songbirds skyward and turtles diving for cover. Their presence has put fear in me and I asked Colin to steer a bit closer to the American side, as if on cue, not four feet from where my paddle parts the water, two smiling faces pop up, <laughs> suspended on light jackets. These junior entrepreneurs had stayed hidden under the canopy of cane that extended out over the edge of the river, and when they heard the airboat depart, they came out and up clutching a large mesh black duffel bag stuffed with waterproof containers. Maybe some contraband, maybe just food and water. They're not startled or alarmed by two men in a canoe. 
passing down the river we share. As the light fades and the wind slackens, the river takes on a gauzy haze that softens her features and lulls us into stopping one last time to listen to the silence that surrounds us. At first, we hear only the gentle lapping of the water parted by the bow. In the next second, the unmistakable, haunting, high-pitched cry of a flock of sandhill cranes cuts through. With my field glasses, I can just make out the oscillating V formation as the cranes float through the strata, a gray cloud high above. They're headed for Mexico or point south, governed by changing seasons across divided countries with an instinct to find what has made them whole since time began. Thank you.